Well, it is incredibly heartening to see so many people here. Thank you for coming. We know your schedules are very busy and so appreciate that you've taken time out to um, come and listen to what we have to say. Um, welcome uh, to the launch of Early Years Study 3. We're pleased to have you here. Um, my name is Olivia Nuema and I am the uh, Executive Director of the Atkinson Foundation and a part of a consortium of uh, foundations uh, that have sought to support uh, early years, uh, early year, sorry, early learning and care uh, policy um, across the country. And um, this will be, I think, by far, and I don't think it's arguable, uh, our biggest triumph. And um, we feel incredibly lucky um, to have had uh, the support and expertise of uh, Jane and Carrie. Okay, so um, sadly also, um, we have recently seen the departure of uh, Fraser Mustard. I'm sorry, I, I feel a little bit, I, I feel saddened in that um, up until the very end, he uh, was contributing not only to this report, but um, in his afterlife, there you see his comments in the Toronto Star. Um, and, and all of that passion and uh, desire to want to make uh, a change is uh, also felt through this report. And so um, certainly our condolences go out to uh, his family, friends and colleagues, and I'm sure um, uh, his, uh, his legacy will be felt for generations to come um, across the world, but certainly uh, in Ontario uh, and particularly in Canada. And also, sadly, um, uh, Margaret McCain cannot be here because the vagaries of plane flight mean that uh, she was unfortunately left stranded and um, all of her best will in the world um, still couldn't find her here uh, today. So um, she wishes us all the best and um, we'll be keeping a keen eye on the conversation we'll be having here today. So uh, to turn over, um, Carrie and Jane will walk you through the report. Uh, Carrie uh, is a co-author of the, and as you see her name in the, uh, on, the, on the cover of the report, but Carrie is also um, uh, a significant contributor to uh, With Our Best Future in Mind and without a doubt um, one of the key uh, inspirations for uh, Ontario's um, all day kindergarten, for which uh, we are pleased to see in some way, not all the way, but some way to uh, getting where we want to be. And uh, Jane Bertrand is the program director for uh, the uh, Margaret Wallace family, Margaret and Wallace McCain Family Foundation, um, and will and has been uh, the key coordinator in addition to uh, a key contributor to uh, Early Years Study 3, which, you, as you may or may not know, um, or if it isn't obvious, comes after Early Years Study 1 and 2. Um, and certainly, <laughs> Carrie was also a significant contributor to Early Years Study 2. So what you have here is um, a wealth of knowledge and expertise in addition to uh, a wealth of uh, experience in implementing such programs and um, we see that culminated in this absolutely fantastic report for which we take a lot of pride in. So I will turn over uh, to Jane who will uh, introduce the content. Hello all. It's pretty lonely standing here today without Fraser Mustard. This is the last in a trio, the latest in a trio of three early years studies, and it's the first time that uh, we've released one without him here at the podium taking us forward. I'm here today to read you Margaret McCain's remarks. She is, Olivia said, stranded, uh, was stranded on a tarmac uh, last night and cannot get back into Canada until later today. We, uh, so she, I will have the honor of reading what she had prepared to speak to you about when, if she'd been here. In his introduction to this edition, Fraser credits many great thinkers who helped shape this understanding of early human development. I, as many of you, was a student at the College of Fraser Mustard and a beneficiary of his learnings. This is a day of mixed emotions for everyone, but particularly for Cheryl Mooney and Dorothy McKinnon, who are both with us today, who worked with Fraser at Founders Network and supported the development of this study as they did the first two. 
Fraser was not only a renowned researcher, he was immensely clever at gathering and distilling work across disciplines to reach profound conclusions. In his view, how education should be organized, not in silos, but with a multidisciplinary perspective, anchored by at least a basic knowledge of early human development. The Institute of Human Development, which he in has inspired at this university, is but one of his many legacies that reflect this thinking and will go forward. Fraser gathered from biologists, geneticists, social scientists, physicians, educators, and economists to document how conditions in early childhood get under the skin to shape the architecture of the developing brain, influencing learning behavior and health with lifelong consequences for the individual and for all of us, for all of society. He took this complex science and distilled it into two endearing concepts that have permeated the popular culture. The years before five last a lifetime, and pay now or pay later. He took those messages into boardrooms and government offices to health, education, and justice officials, not only in Canada, but also into international forums, such as the Aga Khan Development Network and to the World Bank. Many retrospectives of Fraser have labeled him cantankerous. They are right. This is how he expressed his impatience with the brain drain that occurs every time a child is denied the conditions that allow her to thrive. He understood that in modern society, the clan had been replaced by smaller and smaller families who no longer have the capacity to bear the full weight of child rearing. They require support policies that allow parents to balance earning a living and raising a family, that keep families out of poverty, and that promote the first phase of learning that occurs during early childhood. It is this last challenge that a group of foundations has coalesced around. The Atkinson, Chagnon, Hellman, Lawson, McConnell, Mutart, Pratt, and Margaret Wallace McCain family foundations have pooled our efforts around a goal that is ambitious, promising, and fundamentally progressive. To expand publicly funded early childhood education to all two to five-year-olds, it would be available, affordable, top quality, and voluntary. For some, this marks a new direction, not for others. The Lawson Foundation has been a partner of Fraser since the founding of CIR, now CIFAR, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, about three decades ago. Its work inspired the first early years study. Others, like the Atkinson Foundation, have made early education a centerpiece of their work, inspiring the rest of us. Universal early education is not a utopian fantasy. With less effort than starting a whole new social program from scratch, education can expand to bridge the gap between parental leave and formal schooling. By including the option of extended day activities, Canada can have its long-demanded early learning and child care program. Early childhood education for all cannot happen without substantial public investment and public oversight. Earlier study three provides the social, scientific, and economic rationale for this. It introduces the Early Childhood Education Index, a tool to monitor progress in early education province by province. The first results are telling us a very promising story. Since the OECD exposed Canada as a laggard coming last in spending and supports for young children, the provinces have been very busy. Even the termination of the federal provincial child care agreements in 2007 did not stall progress. Across Canada, over 50% of two to four year olds regularly attend an early education program, up from around 20% in 2004. In 2004, Canada devoted 3.5 billion to early education. Today, it's 7.5 billion, a more than 100% increase. But the index isn't about looking backwards. It creates a baseline, a starting point, to chart the progress provinces are taking, to strengthen early education by rationalizing oversight, improving program quality, and increasing wages for early childhood educators. 
Despite budget challenges, policymakers have clearly decided to prioritize young children. As Fraser noted, only a very few short weeks ago, when the early years team was last together, the glass isn't half full. It's filling up nicely. Our co-author, Carrie McQuaig, will tell you more about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And I could hear Margaret's words in those, uh, <clears throat> hear Margaret's voice in, the, in those words. Um, <clears throat> as Jane's comments left, left off, um, there, this is a third tool that the Early Years uh, series has provided us, us with. In 1999, we came out of the 1999 study with uh, the Early Development Index, a tool that looks at, uh, at, at children's uh, development uh, just before they're prepared to enter, enter school. The 2007 study, Early Years 2, uh, promoted uh, uh, the Indicators of Change tool. And that looked at how programs uh, were integrating in order to provide a more solid base to provide early education from. Uh, early Years 3, we're looking at systems. We're looking at that advice that the OECD gave Canada after it uh, exposed us for being the laggard that, uh, that we were, uh, and seeing how much province have, have embraced that, um, that evidence that they were given and, made, uh, and moved on it. Now, we've been using the term early childhood education in this, uh, in this report. And uh, we know that this is a term that's being given lots of, that programs for young children are given lots of terms. They may be in a childcare center, a preschool, a nursery school, in kindergarten, in pre, in pre kindergarten, you know, across the board, they're given different names. We've decided to call it early childhood education. It can take place in any of those, uh, of those settings, but the definition is that it is a group program for, for children which they may or may not attend with their uh, parents. It is staffed by educators trained in early child uh, uh, development practices, and it has a defined curriculum for the, uh, for the, the ch children. So to start with, as we always do, we, we start with the, with the children, and we did an overview in the study about the current status of Canadian uh, families. So, and we discovered, not surprisingly, that they're changing. They're smaller. The average size of a, of a family with a child at home, they have one child uh, at home. They're far more d diverse, and they're not only diverse in the big five metropolitan areas, we're seeing real changes in immigration patterns across the cu uh, country. Not only are immigrants, in fact, immigrants are less likely to come to Ontario than, than ever be before, uh, and we're now seeing them making their homes in Atlantic Canada and the Prairie Provinces in ever greater numbers. The other thing that we see is that first-time mothers are getting older. The average age of the first-time mother is now 29. And in provinces like Ontario and, and BC, a first-time mother is more likely to be in her 30s. But the other thing that we see is that families are also poorer. In fact, just having children puts parents at a risk of being poor. So that even in two-parent families, we're seeing almost 40% uh, rate of, of poverty. And of course, <clears throat> when we move to single parent families, the, the rate goes up. And as a result, there's something interesting that, um, that, that's happening is that we see about a, one third of couples are electing not to have children. And that should tell us something, that we're not creating a very family friendly atmosphere where young people consider, can consider having a, a baby as, as an option. And so that is the very, that those black and gray lines around Canada is, a, is an interesting number, but it's that short number that's also should uh, grab our attention. And that's our poverty rate for seniors. And even when we put ourselves up against the Nordic country, Canada is doing very well. And that is because we had a defined policy perspective around, in the 70s, around addressing senior poverty, and it made a difference. And what we're advocating here is that we give that same considered look at what happens to families. Now, the biggest change, obviously, that's happened to families over the last uh, 35 to 40 years is the continued presence of mothers in the labor force. 
And it doesn't seem to matter about what the age of the, um, of the, the child is or even what the economic ups and downs of the economy have been, is that women's entry into the labor force has been steady, it's, it's been increasing, and it is extremely important to our economy. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a study that the uh, report refers to from the Vanier Institute that looked at that if we actually, if, if mothers all stayed home, just one day said, you know what, I've had it, you know, I'm not getting support, I'm, gonna, I'm going to stay home, $35 billion would be taken out of the economy every year. You know, so we need mothers' work, so there's a little element of fairness that if we need their labor, then we should give them support so that they can balance both work and family life. What, um, you know, the great contribution of, the, uh, of Fraser's work has been is to look at that delicate dance that takes place between uh, the genes that we're born, born with and the environments that, uh, that, we're, that we're in, particularly as, uh, as young children. The effect that nurturing has, that nutrition has, and that, uh, and that the environment has in affecting the development of young brains and then what that means for uh, future health, learning, and behavior across the life course. And it has great um, effects for individuals. But where Fraser wanted to make the point to us again and again is it has a huge effect on society as a whole. Now, there are, there are many aspects that um, affect child outcomes. Obviously, the health and uh, uh, capacity the child is born with makes a, a great deal of, of difference. Then there are all the family uh, factors. What is the family's income? What is the mother's and father's educational um, status? What's the SES of, the, of the, the, the family? And those are all important factors that have to be um, addressed. Um, but in terms of the outside influencers, Preschool and primary school are dominant in influencers. And that's why we started to look at what the impact uh, would be in terms of public policy. One of the things that we found is that we were, if we're going to influence children's uh, de uh, de development, then the quality of the program matters and how long children spend in the program uh, matters. So the, this is a combination of a number of, uh, of studies that, uh, that demonstrate the de developmental impact of uh, preschool education on, on young kids. And there's two things that are interesting about it. One is that uh, even poor quality programs have some development, developmental impact. And this seems to be the, um, uh, you know, when I say poor, we're not talking about neglectful or abusive. They're just not as good quality as they, as they should, should be. Um, but it seems that just having kids together with other kids makes a big difference in their development. And this was particularly true uh, with, the, uh, with the fact that, that, you know, we don't have our own play groups from having five or six brothers and sisters um, it, anymore. We have to recreate those, uh, those play groups in early childhood um, settings. The other thing in terms of, uh, of duration that we should uh, look at is that there also seems to be that tipping point in terms of of, of the amount of time um, a child spends in an, uh, in an early program. And it seems to be around 15 hours a week um, is, is, uh, is, the do is the dose effect. So that those provinces that are um, en route to provide full day uh, kindergarten for kids and not only provide it for five-year-olds, but to stretch it down to four and three-year-olds seem to be on the right track in terms of getting those uh, sustained developmental outcomes that they're looking for. Um, what we know is that those results from good quality uh, programs are enduring. Um, that the research tells us that there is an emotional um, and cognitive uh, link that the, that the neural uh, parts of the brain, that emotional and cognitive uh, uh, are, are rooted in the, in the uh, same place. And so as, um, and that is what really affects self-regulation. Self-regulation, Stuart Shanker would hear, he'd explain it much better, but you know, that's sort of the sweet spot that we get into between high arousal and being too, and being too down, in which we're able to attend to task, in fact, to learn. They also so uh, appear to affect our social co uh, competence. And in terms of what really makes, um, what really children should have 
when they leave preschool and enter into the elementary grades, it appears that self-regulation and social competence are in fact far greater um, gifts that we give them, uh, far more than the cognitive skills that they're often uh, t tested on. Because children that are, th these are, this is what we really mean when we say, are children arriving at school ready to learn? It's because that they're emotionally able to attend to uh, tasks and have the social skills that they can benefit from a school um, uh, setting. The other thing that makes this is, um, important in, turn, in the long-term uh, view is that, uh, is that kids that are doing well by the time they hit about age 11 are more likely to go on and graduate from high school. And then high school is linked with uh, post-secondary attainment, which then has a big impact on uh, future social economic status. This is still a debate in um, Canadian social policy, is that if we have scarce resources, should we be um, focusing those resources at kids who are at risk, or should we be um, taking a more universal approach to, um, to the provision of pr programs? And this particular um, set that comes from the NL NLSCY looks at vocabulary skills, and this could be repeated for a number of, vi of variables. But if you look at the left-hand side of the of the uh, of the, the chart, you see there that in, indeed um, kids from low-income families tend to have uh, more difficulties than kids from middle-class and affluent families. But the real picture is really on the right-hand side. Am I doing this right? My left and right. <laughs> that I'm thinking. That's my left. On your left. This is the right. This is the right-hand side that I'm that I'm looking that I'm looking at, at now. It's the numbers. So there's percentages and there's numbers, right? So when we actually start counting up the number of poor kids that are having difficulty, we see that they're in fact outnumbered by um, middle-class and affluent and affluent kids. So really, if we want to reach kids that are having difficulty, we better look at programming across the across the spectrum. And there's a, there's a note here for middle class parents as well, because you know, there may be a gap between low income, uh, what's uh, difficulties that uh, kids from low income families are having and kids from um, uh, middle class families. But also you need to consider the gap between middle, kids from middle class families and kids from affluent families. And that, that gap as a percentage wise is, is about the same. So reason for concern. We also find that when you, in terms of public policy, is that when you take a, a universal perspective, you're actually more success, you know, if your goal is catching poor, poor kids, taking a universal perspective is actually more effective at catching uh, poor kids. So this is a comparison of how um, childcare funding goes to uh, children in Quebec and in Ontario. So true, there's a gradient in the, uh, in the Quebec story where Low-income kids are less likely to access ch child care than, um, than affluent kids. Uh, but there are far more children um, across, you know, from low-income families who are receiving a child care program in Quebec as opposed to Ontario. And in Ontario, we put almost all our money, all our child care money is targeted to, uh, to low-income low kids. So this may be something to, you know, for policymakers to think about in terms of if you want to catch kids at risk, what is the most effective way of doing it? I mean, the big story, and this comes from Fraser, you pay me now or you pay, or you pay me later. And this is one study from the Canadian um, Council on Learning, and there could be, uh, and there are many, many others of its, of its type. And it looks at what the cost is of one cohort of early school leavers. And when you, um, when you add up the, uh, you know, the social cost in terms of the social assistance um, co uh, co collected and the employment insurance uh, co collected and the additional cost uh, in the criminal justice system and put that against the taxes that they are not paying and the employment insurance that they are not paying into, it's a cost of about $2.2 billion a year. And when we figure that out over the lifetime of each cohort, it's $18 billion. 
So these are not insignificant figures when it comes to really being able to quantify what the cost of failing our kids in the early years are. Fraser has often returned to this, uh, to this theme, um, that it is difficult to have a democratic society if you don't have a literate society. So how do, how do citizens engage in decision-making, particularly as the world we're going through a ecological and a social re um, revolution without the capacity to be informed about, uh, about the debates that are taking place and participate in them? So for this particular um, chart shows uh, a coalescing between the uh, study done by the OECD and Stats Canada that looked at uh, the link between literacy and social uh, engagement. And, you know, Canada has been pretty lucky so far is that we have been spared the, um, you know, the extreme, uh, ideological extreme, extremism that has uh, plagued uh, much of the rest of our OECD friends. But this was a burning issue for Fraser is that if we want to maintain the Canada that we have come to love and value, we better pay very close attention to the capacity of our citizens. On to some very good, um, good parts of the report, chapter four, which I, some of you I will hope love, is, uh, is a look at uh, what the economic benefits of investing in early childhood are. And traditionally, we've had to rely on the big American studies that look at um, you invest in the, in the child and then you look at how much money they save you down, down the road and you reap your benefits, you know, when the children are, you know, graduating university or are, are 40 years old and they're not in jail. Um, what has been uh, different about the uh, most Canadian studies that have looked at the cost benefits of early childhood is that they, they're not only looking at the value to the child, which is substantive, they're also looking at uh, the value to the family and to the, and to the uh, community. So there's not only, a, uh, so the cost benefit comes, yes, from um, a better start for kids, but it also comes from allowing more parents to enter the labor market, to remain in the labor market, to upgrade their, their skills. As a result, they pay more taxes, they draw less on, on social pr programs, and those all add up to great, um, to great social be benefits and, pay, and pay, payback. Um, this particular slide shows work that Robert Fairholm did, which, uh, and it was uh, done during the 2008 crash when uh, governments were looking at effective ways to uh, put their money into stimulus uh, spending. And his work found that, in fact, you know, if you really wanted to stimulate the economy, the best place you could put your money is in childcare and education. You know, unfortunately, we tend to put it in construction, which is not as effective as, uh, as ECE. Um, but yet we have this information. Maybe we can go forward with it. Um, I think, though, one of our, our best uh, findings were done, you know, specifically for the early years study three by economist uh, Pierre Fortien from the uh, University of Montreal. And Pierre went out to answer just a couple of questions. One was, how many more mothers are working in Quebec because of low-cost childcare? And he established that there was about 70,000 more Quebec mothers are in the, are in the labor force because of low-cost childcare. And the combination of the taxes that those women pay and the uh, reduced uh, benefits that they draw on because, um, you know, because their, their family income has raised more than pays for the entire cost of Quebec's pr program. So it's, a, it's quite a story that when we hear that we just can't afford it, it's now very easy to say, yes, you can. But I think that one of the most interesting um, findings from Pierre's work is that 717 number. And that's because when we pay income tax, we pay some to our province, but most of it goes to the, uh, to the federal level. And so in Fortin's words, uh, Ottawa gets 717 million a year from Quebec's childcare program, and they put nothing into it. Uh, so perhaps that this is a uh, particularly as the 
uh, earlier childcare agreements with the feds are expiring in 2012, uh, this may be a, uh, at the beginning of a negotiation that provinces could have with the federal government for their fair share of the taxes that their early education systems put back into the, into the economy. So as Jane mentioned in her remarks, the provinces have been busy and that they have um, have been prioritizing spending on, uh, on early childhood. And one of the things that we did was look at sort of, you know, to be fair, because obviously some provinces have great big budgets and a lot of capacity and some provinces don't. So we looked at what was the percentage of spending on all early childhood programs against what a province's entire bu budget was. And we were trying to work that back to one of the lessons from the OECD, um, which uh, was suggested that uh, jurisdictions that had um, sort of developed early childhood systems were devoting about 1% of G at least 1% of GDP to those, uh, to those systems. And we figured out that, you know, usually about the 3% of um, the 3% mark is when we begin to hit 1% of 1% uh, of GDP. So, so far, Quebec is only, um, has only made it over that, that mark, but we can see that the others are making headway. Uh, this is also a, um, a nice story. If we had uh, shown you that uh, just-in-time sort of slide over time, you would have seen this slide, uh, this slide grow, so that when we uh, put them all together, we see that about 52% of two- to four-year-olds now regularly attend an ECE program in Canada. And we looked at two- to four-year-olds because as we know, the majority of five-year-olds are uh, in a kindergarten uh, pr uh, pr program. Uh, two to four-year-olds is that high demand of uh, unmet need that's, uh, that's out there. So we thought that it gave us a, really a more comprehensive picture of where, what the status of early childhood was if we looked at that age group. Earlier study one suggested that we have a, um, a tool which would monitor uh, the well-being of young children before their entry to school. The early development instrument was uh, de uh, de developed and it's now used uh, by all but one jurisdiction um, across the uh, country. So this is giving us a really good, um, a really good uh, database on uh, how, our kids, uh, how our kids are doing and what communities can do to intervene on behalf of their, of their children. So this brings us to the tool that we offer you out of this earlier study, and that is the Early Childhood Education Index. Um, and so it does a couple of things. It, uh, it provides a snapshot of provincial early uh, education services. Um, but it's not about we wanted the index to go further than just counting spaces and counting dollars. We actually wanted to see if jurisdictions were spending the money in the most effective way to promote ac equitable access for, for families and good programs for, for kids. So we took that, um, that those recommendations that the OECD shared, all of them backed up by lots and lots of, of research, and we applied them to the uh, jurisdictions around sort of five ca categories. Three are showing here, governance, funding, access, quality, and, account and accountability are the other two. Um, we came up with 19 benchmarks uh, to, uh, to, assess where the, to assess where the provinces are, are at. Um, we were limited, and everyone who's ever done one of these will, uh, will tell you, we were limited by the lack of data. We were uh, limited by the quality of the data, and we were limited by the consistency of the data. So the, for example, um, we were not able to include the territories in this round of the index because there was just not enough information. We were also not able to um, include the uh, uh, Aboriginal kids on First Nations in this, in this round. Nor were we able to answer some really big questions like affordability, 
which has a great deal to do with access. Um, the, there was just not consistent data there. But nevertheless, we did, um, we were able to come up with some things. Um, so we looked at integrated governance. I mean, one of the things that the first things that the OECD said was um, that if you want to be effective, you should bring your early childhood programs under the, uh, under the same roof so that you can have a common vision, a common approach, and a common management um, structure. Uh, so we did that. We looked at where, uh, where ECE programs sat across the uh, country, and now four jurisdictions have <clears throat> consolidated all of their early childhood programs under a single ministry. But we also wanted to drill down to see if, um, if in fact, they were just sitting under the same roof or were they, or were they actually being, you know, managed in a in a consistent way, both at the provincial level and on the uh, and on the ground? And then last, was there a clear, really a clear policy framework that was driving not only the education part but the childcare part and related and related services? And I want to make it uh, make it really clear here that when when we talk about benchmarks, these are not aspirational goals. Uh, the benchmarks were chosen because they were considered to be the absolute minimum um, to which you could sink before you were really not meeting, you know, the basic needs of, uh, of children and families through your uh, through your your system. We adapted the benchmarks to Canadian reality so that um, at least one jurisdiction had um, had attained the uh, the benchmark or was very close to um, attaining it. You'll see the numbers. The numbers represent the values that was given to each um, each of the uh, benchmarks. Each one uh, totaled three, so that all five categories were equally weighted. That's for the statisticians. Uh, we looked at funding. Uh, you know, do uh, does it promote uh, quality? Does it promote equitable um, access? Uh, is it is it well managed? Uh, so. We, there's, again, the research here is showing that money that goes into operations is likely to uh, promote better, um, better outcomes than money that drives a market uh, system. A salary and fee scale, again, uh, denotes state management. And the, the level of uh, budget, again, is looking for that approach to the 1% of GDP uh, that seems to be the, um, the tipping point in terms of mature early childhood services. Access was another um, uh, area that, uh, that we uh, looked at. Um, when it came to equity of access, there were, you know, there are many, many issues around equity of access. There's, you know, language and culture and, and, and you know, geographical location and hours of service, et cetera. But the one area that all of the provinces have, um, have made some efforts towards is uh, trying to include children with special needs in early education pr programs. We looked at the learning environment. Um, and here, you know, there's long established research that uh, confirms that the quality of early childhood education programs begins with staff that are well-trained and respected and have the resources um, to deliver good, uh, good programming. So we were able to gather some information across jurisdictions on that. When it came to account, um, accountability is out of the um, federal provincial territorial agreements of the of early 2000, the provinces did agree that they would uh, provide annual reports to their publics, they were called, uh, on uh, how they were progressing. So we were looking to see whether or not they were complying with that. Um, do they have, uh, you know, are, were they interested in what, in what went into their early childhood programs, not only what kids were supposed to do while they were in them, did they actually pay some attention to the quality of the environments? And finally, were they collecting um, EDI or population measures? And this is the way they um, ended up looking. Uh, so in our first iteration, uh, we have uh, three provinces that have made it, um, that are standing on the podium for first, second, and, uh, and third spot. 
Um, the rest of them go between uh, 1.5 and our own Ontario at, um, at 6.5. And this may not seem like a really optimistic story, but, um, but I tell you, if we had to run the provinces through this in 2007, uh, only Quebec would have been past the halfway mark and the rest of them would have been down around three or two. So I know that particularly if you're deep into the field and you're always feeling like every day is a struggle, <laughs> um, which it is, uh, it's, you know, you might feel that there's no progress, but when you actually get up there and take a big look at what it takes to make a, an effective and efficient quality system, there has been incredible pro, uh, pr progress. And when we uh, did the policy scan of the provinces, is many, um, is many, many uh, others, I think the next time that this is done, uh, hopefully in the next uh, two, to, two to three years, we're going to see a different uh, picture as those uh, jurisdictions put their plans into, into place. So I think that our, our news from this is this is, you know, this is a, this is a good news story. Uh, we may be getting our national child care program one province at a time. Thanks. So just that you know the uh, study is available in English and, and French. Uh, you can download it from the website. With the web, also on the website is a lot of the background information that went into the report, into the uh, into the index. It provides the rationale for the uh, for the uh, index. I just want to flag a little thing about indexes: is um, uh, just like curriculum isn't static, neither are uh, indices, and uh, the Index will be housed at the Atkinson Center. It will be uh, put out for further consultation and refinement, uh, so that when we're going to the field again, we may see some, we may see some change, changes to it. But all with the idea of having a, you know, a solid tool where um, citizens can hold their uh, jurisdictions accountable for not only how much money they're spending, but how they're spending the money. Um, so. Uh thought we would open it up to questions now. Um, anybody have any questions? There's always questions or food. You can move right to food if you like. <laughs> This, this just makes so much sense. Why do, do we know that there are programs being instituted? What are the barriers and why the heck aren't we doing it? And, and some of the study um, you know, discusses what we know about um, Aboriginal, uh, what Aboriginal program are available, what programs are available for Aboriginal uh, communities. But beyond that, there have there has not been assessments, right? They are, you know, they. It's difficult to get the count. It's difficult to get who's there. It's difficult to um, to know how much funding is going into them because there's a lot of overlapping of of funding, and there is not, you know, there's not the reporting in terms of um, staff qualifications and those sort of all of those indicators. So we were unable to address. Um, you know, address Aboriginal pro programming um, across a across a consistent set of, of indicators. So that's why they that's why it's not there. And and one of the things that we want to do in the next iteration is to see what we can do to address that. In addition to the territories. Right, and that, I guess that was really my question. It wasn't really directed at you. It, mm. You know, there, there was no criticism implied. But you would say that that would be a key next step. Is is getting those benchmarks nailed down. And then um, start, you know, focusing programming um, into those areas. Well, I think you know the fact that we that there is so little that we can measure around Aboriginal uh, programs is an indication of how much value we you know yes. we put on them, right? You know, uh, so probably as a first step, we are going to need um, we are going to need some great researchers to go in and start gathering some of that data together.
and also a bit about how Manitoba uh, got ahead without I'm going to uh, allow my colleague to answer that one because she did most of the work on these profiles. Uh, one of the things that's online on the website are individual provincial profiles uh, that outline how some of this was gathered in more detail. So that, that would help to answer your question. But in general, uh, Manitoba has been moving ahead over the last decade in how it allocates funding. It's moving to much more program funding. It has set salary scales for early childhood educators and consistently moved them up. It has set fee ceilings for parents. It has done a num taken, you know, it hasn't, does not have full day kindergarten yet, but I think it's one of the things that's in discussion. They have come out with a very comprehensive policy framework that look, wants to look at how to have an integrated ECE policy um, across education and uh, early learning and child care. So it's taken a number of steps forward and has increased its funding quite substantially, particularly in how it funds. It's moved away from just fee subsidies, which is very unstable for programs, and moved to a much higher concentration on program funding. I'm going to embarrass somebody here just for a moment. Janet Jameson is here from uh, Manitoba, is a colleague who we work closely with on a sister project, the Science of ECD, and it was something else Fraser was deeply involved with. And she may be able to answer some further questions about what this situation is in Manitoba if you want to talk afterwards. So, yes, you can connect. Um, and, and Ontario has certainly taken some big steps forward in full day kindergarten. And, and, and uh, Ontario's coverage on the two to four year old is, is uh, ahead of many provinces because we have junior kindergarten in place. These are big steps and things to applaud, but there are other things not in place, further behind on how we're allocating the program funding and, uh, and also not having that. Into, we don't have an integrated uh, policy framework yet for early childhood. We do have our best future in mind, and Charles Pascal is here today with us. And that, quite frankly, Charles outlined a fine policy framework, but it hasn't been fully adopted by government policy to date. <coughs> so does that give you a, a sense? Sorry? BC. Well, BC's done full day kindergarten, but they haven't done a whole lot of other things. They have a split jurisdiction where early learning is in the Ministry of Education and the curriculum is over here. And child care is spread over about three ministries. And yes, they've gone forward with full day kindergarten and I think they've done a rather good job on it around the curriculum and linking it with their early learning framework, but they haven't done a whole lot of other things. And there, a, a whole lot of their spending Oh, um, 46 million, I believe, of their spending on subsidies goes to unregulated childcare, out of which, you know, some may be just fine, but a whole lot we don't know. So it's not early childhood education, or can't be defined as that. So that's one of the reasons, one of the ways in which BC doesn't do as well as it might. Robin. So wonderful report, and there's a certain symmetry that it would come out between Fraser's death and his memorial service, so uh, perfect landing. My question is, though, going forward, he was such a craftsman uh, at the knowledge translation, and you've done a beautiful job today. Where does it go from here? Have you got some webinars planned? Have you, how can this uh, reach the folk across the country that can uh, you know, continue to move it forward? Thank you, Robin. Well, we do have a, a fairly active website that probably was launched as we are talking today, and it will be uh, it will be growing and things will be on. It'll be the good place to go to keep on top of events, and it will become we'll add on new information as it comes along. So that's that's one piece. Is stay in touch with that. Yes, we do want to have some webinars coming in. They won't happen before the new year, but in the new year we will have a series of webinars probably organized around different topics. Um, Marla Sobolowski is here today with us. She was one of the contributors who worked very closely with Fraser around the gene by environment story and other things, and she doesn't know it, but we're hoping she'll do a webinar on that. Thank you, Marla, and we saw you smile, so I guess that's agreement. Uh, no, I'm, we will be having... <laughs> 
We will be working, many, many people have their fingerprints on this and wanting to work in, and bring together under some different themes around that come out of earlier study three. Uh, we expect to be doing more work on the economic benefits and a webinar around that and some of the, uh, you know, there are five major Canadian studies now. Gord Cleveland's here today and his was, he and Michael Krasinski are one of those studies. We'd like to get something together on that for, on that topic for webinars. We will be doing regional launches. There is a system launch or a parallel launch today in Montreal, uh, hosted by the Chagnon Foundation, one of our partners, that's got why apparently this study is uh, got a lot of media interest in Montreal and some in in Quebec and some international so we'll be working closely with them on on some future events we have some public events planned for Atlantic Canada uh, we will be having a symposium and day in Winnipeg in that Red River College is going to take the lead on hosting thank you Janet we did just talk about that one before uh, in in the second half of May so we're looking for that and then there is an international conference that the Center of Excellence for Early Child Development is hosting on June 5th-ish, but we'll, uh, that date might not quite be right, and Margaret McCain has been asked to be a keynote speaker from Canada, and we'll be talking about the earlier study there. So we see a very active post-launch January to... Um, in the Summer Institute here on June 7th, this will be the topic too that we will be taking forward. And we've just started to think about uh, some a potential uh, international symposium on the index in fall 2012. But that's really preliminary and I won't name anybody for responsibility for that yet. But so there are a number of things and we would like to hear those ideas. I'm talking about the collective we of all of the foundations who are here and many are here today. Atkinson's here today. I see McConnell has come in, <laughs> slipped in the back. Steve Haggerty's here from McConnell. And Angie's here, Angie Cloran's here from Lawson. And of course, Olivia and Christine are here from uh, Atkinson Foundation. We are going to be working together for, uh, uh, you know, to do what we can to take this forward, but we're looking for others and other opportunities to, uh, and the website is kind of the collecting place. And we're going to practice using the other things, Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> Pardon? Is there a hashtag? <laughs> I, I haven't, yeah, we're, we're going to be learning. We're going to be in, you know, seeing if neurons can still develop in our elderly years as we try and do that. But we are looking at different ways that we can do that. And, and another vehicle that will take this forward is the third edition of the Science of ECD, a multimedia curriculum resource which is now used across Canada and internationally. Lawson Foundation supports Red River College in doing that. And that brings, that, that sort of was born out of earlier study one. And as you know, the second edition was kind of parallel to earlier study two, and we'll be working really closely with Janet and her colleagues around bringing this together into the third edition, which will be out next fall, and that gets used in a lot of education settings across, across the country. So that's another way in which we'll be taking it forward. Jan. Well, I think that's a really interesting idea. I mean, this this is a tool that has been um, constructed around a central notion, uses the framework of the OECD, paid attention to selecting measures and then the benchmarks based on research, and it has been reviewed by some people who have developed other indexes, like Steve Barnett in, in, in the States and Magdalena Janus and and, and others. It's, so it's got, you know, it's got validity to a point, and now the next step is to try it out and see what we can do with it. It's an innovative tool. It's not it's going to, we can't use it, I don't think we can do the classical testing uh, that's usually done for validity, but that's why it's coming into the Atkinson Center at OIZ in an academic route, and I'm really glad to hear you talking about it, Jan, because you're part of that, and You'll be, uh, you'll be able to work on how it can be used. We'd also like to see how it could be used in other jurisdictions for some comparative stuff, but it's quite possible you could drill it down 
and into, you know, and, and try it out. It's very exciting, though, you know, it's we're very exciting the next steps. Carrie, do you want to add? We, we were able to brief another um, uh, policymakers in a number of jurisdictions um, around with the uh, with the index uh, in advance and 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 I think it was doing what we, what we wanted it to do, and that is that policymakers looked at it and said, okay, here's gaps, you know, that we obviously need to pay, you know, to, to pay attention to. Because when you're looking at across the, you know, at across the uh, five categories, you're looking at a balanced system, you know, and, and it, you know, attention needs to be paid to each. And this was just a, a very um, upfront way of making it clear to policymakers, you know, where there were gaps and where they were doing doing quite well, and their responses have been exactly along along those lines. Is oh, we need to make progress here, and and I guess we get a pat on the back for here, right? So. So why don't we? Um, I'll just say thank you for coming, <laughs> and uh, there's some food uh, out back, please. Uh, Please eat it. There's copies of the of the report. Um, if you want copies in French, there uh, they are also there. And uh, stay in chat. And thank you very much for coming on a cold day. Great.